Hi, Dr. Allison here. Welcome back to our next episode in the exciting journey of unlocking the eye and disease. Right, so we, in our first video we spoke about function is everything. Determine the function, then at least you know what you're talking about. So we've standardized it right down to no light perception. The next step is pupil reaction. You must at least do a pupil reaction on the patient because that is a window to many diseases. And if you, you have this golden opportunity to do it on the first sitting because we need to know where it starts. So that is our next our next really, really sophisticated piece of equipment that we need to examine the eye. Our first piece of sophisticated equipment was a Snellen chart. The second one is a light, not even an ophthalmoscope. I'm, I'm not doing ophthalmoscope yet. This is just a light, common garden variety light. You can use the light on your cell phone if you want. Okay, because we're going to talk about pupil reaction and, 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 the, and the mechanisms at play, which will help us to uh, determine what uh, eye diseases we can, we can think about uh, and determine. Um, just remember I spoke last time about, about the cranial nerves, that six of the 12 cranial nerves have something to do with the eye. And we must, we'll recap that and go through it again. Eh? The second one, the third one, the fourth one, the fifth one, the sixth one, and the seventh cranial nerve all have something to do with the eye. And we're going to dismantle that in further videos. But let's go on to pupil reaction. Right, so here's our patient, and we need to determine his pupil reaction. So the first thing we do is remove the glasses, put them down, relax the patient, put your, head on, put your hand on his head if you can, uh, just to do that touch thing that, that, that the patient is nice and relaxed, and he's going to do what he wants, to, uh, and he's going to work with you. The most important thing is to make him look at a distant object. Uh, he must try and look at a distant object, so find a distant object on the other side of the room, six meters and further if you can, because then his accommodation reflex hasn't kicked in. We're going to talk about accommodation reflex. Accommodation reflex is basically the triad that's attached to one another. When you look at a near object, you get convergence, you get meiosis, and you get accommodation. These are all attached to one another. So if you let him look at you, here, yeah, close to you or at the light, he's going to have an accommodative reflex and you're not really going to be testing his eye properly. So let him look at a distant object, let him be nice and relaxed, and, the, and, and you go it from there. Right, so now, what happens if we shine a light into this eye? We shine a light into this eye and take it away. We shine a light into this eye and take it away. What happens? When we shine the light into this eye, this pupil will contract the direct pupil will contact. That's called the direct reflex. It, it sh the, the pupil gets smaller just because you shone the light into it. What happens if I shine a light into this eye? What happens to this pupil? It also contracts. Why does it contract? Via the consensual reflex. There's a consensual reflex. So if I shine a light into one eye, both pupils will contract. Right. So if I shine a light into this eye, it will contract. Why? Because of the direct reflex. Why will this one contract? Because of the consensual reflex. So that's a very important point. So you get a direct and a consensual reflex. Now, in a, in a very important disease, in any optic nerve disease, you have a very interesting thing that happens. If you shine a light into this eye, and into this eye, and into this eye, and into this eye, there was a guy called Marcus Gunn. He was, a, he was a very, very clever surgeon. He was actually a neurosurgeon. And he said, you know, in some patients, when I do the flashlight test, there is a paradoxical dilatation to light. In other words, he shines it in the one eye, and the pupil actually dilates rather than contracts. Which is, and he called this a paradoxical dilatation to light. Now, this is one of those typical things in medicine where he made an absolutely perfect observation and a relatively imperfect assumption. Uh, and this happens a lot in medicine. We spoke about it in the previous series. Is that correct observation but not necessarily a correct assumption because it's a bit like, you know, in, in school you, you, you were taught the, uh, the uh, uh, Pythagorean theory. Uh, Pythagoras said that uh, the square on the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares on the other two sides. 
No, that's wrong. You must get the definition right. Definitions are very important. In any right angle triangle, in any right angle triangle, the square on the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares on the other two sides. If it's any other triangle, Pythagoras' theorem doesn't work. So we, we use the same principle here. In the Marcus Gunn pupil, something else is happening here. Let me show you. I shine a light in this eye, and it contracts, and this one contracts. If I swing it across, this one dilates. And then I swing it back, it contracts, and this one contracts. And I swing it to this one, and it dilates. That's where it comes from. So it's not a paradoxical dilatation to light that I just shine in that eye. What I need to do, I need to pre-constrict it via the consensual reflex from the other side. So the definition of the Marcus Gunn pupil is in a swinging flashlight test. So you have to do a swinging flashlight test. You've got to go from constricting the pupil on the one side straight over to the other side. You can't go away and then shine it and then expect it to dilate. It's not going to do that. Because it's dilating, because it's direct reflex isn't working because the eye optic nerve is not working. So it's pre-constricted. You constrict it on the one side, the consensual constricts it here, and then I swing it across. And as soon as I swing it across quickly, this eye doesn't see the light so well because of the optic nerve problem and dilates because it doesn't see the light and the other one dilates. So it's not a paradoxical dilatation to light. It is in a pre-constricted pupil via the consensual reflex that the, that, the, that the pupil dilates, not because it sees the light, but because it doesn't see the light. Very interesting. Now, and that's called the Marcus Gunn pupil. Now, why is that important? Marcus Gunn is a very important tool and a very nice tool to have in your, in your, in your quiver in, w with all the other arrows, is diagnostic arrows, because it tells you that there is a disease process in that 2.5 centimeters of optic nerve before it gets to the chiasm. Simple as that. Pre-chiasmal optic nerve disease. That's it. So if he's got a positive Marcus gun, in other words, in the swinging flashlight test, if one of the pupils dilate, that eye <coughs> has problems with its optic nerve. Interesting. But it's got to be pre-chiasmal. Because post-chiasmal, half of them go this way, half of them go that way, it's not going to do that. You're going to get hemianopias. So it has to be pre-chiasmal. How incredible is that? With a flashlight, silly little flashlight, and some knowledge, we know that this guy has a problem in his optic nerve. We haven't done a CT scan, we haven't done an MRI, we have done nothing fancy. We just know the anatomy well and know the reflexes very well. Marcus Gunn pupil. Huh? Optic nerve problems. Remember, we spoke about optic nerve in the previous one. The difference between papal edema and and uh, uh, and a swollen disc because of optic neuritis or papillitis. Basically, someone with an optic neuritis or a papillitis will have a positive Marcus gun, and someone with a papal edema won't, because he's just got a swelling of the disc. The other one has a disease of that optic nerve. Papal edema. Ach, a Marcus gun pupil. Extremely important clinical thing that you can do so easily with a little light. Write it down in the file because it's extremely important for the next guy because he needs to know was the Marcus gun positive because what sometimes happens is now someone puts atropine in his eyes so that he can look at the posterior pole. For what reason nobody knows but he puts atropine in there which lasts a whole week to 10 days in the eye. He's got this dilated pupil and it's very important for you to know whether he's got an optic nerve problem or not. And you don't until you've done a Marcus gun because this is the next pearl. Is optic nerve disease. Very often you have this incredible paradox. The patient sees nothing and the doctor sees nothing. Isn't that incredible? You look in the back, the patient says, I can't see a thing. I'm, I'm down to finger counting. He's down to hand movements. He's down to, to, you know, almost light perception in the one eye. You examine that eye and you look in the back of the eye with your ophthalmoscope and you look and you do all sorts of things. 
and you see nothing wrong. You see absolutely nothing wrong. The patient sees nothing. The doctor sees nothing. That is, but if you did a Marcus gun, it would be obvious. He doesn't have nothing. He has a positive Marcus gun. So it's important to do that before you dilate the pupil. You must do a swinging flashlight test to test whether he has a Marcus gun, positive or not. Right, then the second one is a little bit old-fashioned and, and silly, I suppose, but it's in most of the textbooks just to tell you what it is. It's called an Argyle Robinson pupil. And this is sort of coming back with the, with, the, with the advent of HIV and the antibiotics not working so well and third world countries that are emerging, is neurosyphilis. Neurosyphilis gives you uh, uh, damage to the tapes dorsalis, and this creates a light near dissociation. In other words, when you shine a light into someone's eye, he doesn't react very well. The pupil is sluggish and doesn't react well. But if you ask him to look at a near object, you say to him, look at my finger, look at my finger, look at my finger, and you induce the uh, uh, accommodative reflex, the accommodative triad of meiosis, accommodation, and convergence, the pupil does go down. So there's a dissociation between the light reflex and the near reflex. That's called an Argyle Robinson pupil and is a sign of neurosyphilis rare disease in, 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 in first world countries, but uh, it it's, has a resurgence in recent times because of the, the failure of our antibiotics and, and infrastructure and HIV and so on that, as a complication. So just remember that, uh, that uh, pupil reaction that, that you could see something funny happening there. Remember the near reflex? Very important to understand that triad, eh? The triad of accommodation. To uh, meiosis, convergence and accommodation. So you not only shine a light in his eye to, to test his pupils, do the swinging flashlight test, do all those things. What you need to do is you need to say, okay, look at my finger and you look closer, 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 closer and you hold it about 30 centimeters away or you give him something to look at, a little bottle or whatever and you get him to get into the near reflex. Three things must happen in the eye. He must converge, his pupils get smaller and of course, he accommodates to keep it in focus. Over the age of 50, press biopia and so on, he won't, he won't actually keep it in focus, but he will always converge and the pupils will get smaller. It's important to test that and write it down. Right, now just to play a little bit, uh, those are very important pupil reflexes. W what's going to happen is they're going to call you to casualty. You're a junior doctor, you get called to casualty, even if you're a senior doctor, you get called to casualty, and you, you, you have a look at, a, a, at the, the patient's pupils, and you see that they are dilated. It's a unilateral dilated pupil. You have one pupil that's dilated. And you, you want to know what the hell is going on here. He's got one dilated pupil. Uh, you, you can't really do a Marcus gun because it doesn't react very well and so on. So it's very important to, to, to have a couple of things in your head when you get to a, a, a unilateral dilated pupil. Um, the first thing uh, to remember is that belladonna's or, 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 or atropine type side effects are in very many houseplants. Uh, things like oleander, things like uh, uh, some of the, the really nice flowers that you have. You can be cutting your hedge, rub your eye on the one side, and you get this dilated pupil because of the belladonna effect of, of, of the sap from that. Uh, so when you, when you see a single dilated pupil, it's not necessarily trouble. Do a good history. History is important here. Didn't he maybe rub his eye didn't he maybe get something in the eye? The other thing is uh, GPs tend to, to, to have atropine and put that in the eye or, or the clinic that he went to put atropine in his eyes. Now atropine sticks around for, it's a dilator, it's a very strong dilator of the pupil. The problem with it is it sticks around for 7 to 10 days and he's already forgotten that he got a drop at the, at the clinic and he sits with his dilated pupil and you're wondering what to do. So very often just follow up and... Uh, uh, and no, no real problem there. Uh, uh, just good history, follow up nicely. Uh, what's also important to remember is that a traumatic iris can also be relatively dilated. In other words, you, you get traumatic midriasis. Uh, the trauma causes that. And they could even, if it's old trauma, it could be a little bit of sinichia sitting there. And he's got this dilated pupil. 
The other problem, uh, that, that, so history is very important there. Acute trauma. In other words, he had a bang on his eye now and he's got this dilated pupil. That's also traumatic midriasis. It will come right. And, 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 and good history is very important there. Uh, chronic uveitis, if he says he has this disease where his, his eye gets, gets red and then goes away and gets red and goes away over years, that can create synechia and give you uh, pupils that are not equal, that the one appears bigger than the other one. It's very important then to, to also note what the ambient light was. If the ambient light was poor, it won't appear different. they both be dilated. But as soon as the ambient light gets more, the, the, the normal pupil will constrict and, and bring it into effect. So it's always important to remember those things. Uh, it could also just be congenital. In other words, it could be there forever. A guy like uh, the, the most famous guy with, with a dilated pupil was David Bowie. Uh, he, he, everybody, you look at any of his old photos, it looks as though he's got two different colored eyes. He's got blue eyes and there's one eye sort of a dark black color. Uh, that's just a massively dilated pupil, which was congenital and uh, and was part of his his uh, persona at at a stage that that it's not only got the funky hairstyle and the funky clothes and the interesting uh, 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 spaceman uh, type uh, songs that he that he did and he was ahead of his time. He also had this dilated congenital pupil. Um, then, okay, if you if you have bilateral dilated pupils. Uh, um, the bilateral uh, dilated pupils can can uh, falls into two categories really. If you've got a bilateral dilated dilated pupil and he's got a red conjunctiva, and he's a little bit sort of inappropriate, so you you go into casualty. It's a youngish person, or it doesn't have to be a youngish person, but it, uh, he he's sort of inappropriate. There's no trauma, inappropriate behaviour. He's got this red uh, conjunctiva, and he's got these dilated pupils. Marijuana is probably high on your list there, eh? So he could have had marijuana drops or eaten the cookies or done, done his thing. Uh, that creates a dilated pupil with, with, a, with a red discoloration and inappropriate behavior. So that also separates the men from the boys because a fixed dilated pupil, bilateral, as you know, is brain dead. Brain dead. No coming back from it, probably. Okay, so fixed dilated pupil in casualty extremely important diagnosis that uh, if someone is comatose and he has a fixed dilated pupil trouble big trouble neurosurgeons everybody needs to be involved CT scans MRIs need to be involved but someone with that's had marijuana overdose more or less will also have a dilated pupil also appear comatose but they normally the giveaway there is a little bit of history the fact that the the fact that he was at a party, the fact that da, and he's got this red conjunctiva, so that's the dilated pupil. Um, then you get the pinpoint pupils; those with the tiny little pupils. Uh, if you go into casualty, it's a person with a tiny little pupil. There's only one really thing that gives really really small pupils like that, um, and and that's the opiates. All right, so he's he's uh, the best thing to do there is check the arms. Get the history, check the arms, see the puncture marks, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the history of, 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 of opiate misuse is normally pinpoint pupil. So um, that, that swings it a bit. So if you, if you suspect drugs, uh, dilated pupils, marijuana, soft drug, probably not a problem. Pinpoint pupils, careful, that's starting to come into the opiates. We're starting to get into the heavy stuff um, and, and you, need to, you need to go down that wormhole a little bit. Um, right, so that's that's pupils. That's the important things about pupil reactions. Um, join me in the next video where I now take the pupil reaction and we couple that to ptosis. So now we've done pupils that are abnormal in their own right. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go pupils that are associated with the ptosis and what's probably happening there. Join me then.